Having briefly sketched the throw the bastards out form of our civil religion, I'd like to apply it to Trump's election. I will look at jobs, immigration, trade agreements, and Trump's bad boy behavior. Americans across the political spectrum who are angry today have legitimate complaints of economic squeeze, as we've discussed. The fear that it will worsen and the sense that they are powerless to stop it. Some, often older and white, see the complexion of the country growing browner. They fear that with this demographic shift, the value of hardworking self-reliance is fading. The values, after all, that gave ordinary people like themselves a chance. I'd like to stress this. It is not the desire to be pampered, but the values of hard work and self-reliance that they fear are being replaced by government handouts, handouts, freebies, to those who aren't working, and by a political and economic system that is no longer responsive to their own hard work. Sociologist Arlie Hochschild describes this understanding of what's going on as someone who is, feels that they are working hard for the American dream and yet seeing it fade away as others are jumping ahead in the line. Some of them are immigrants, some of them are black, and some of them are refugees who get aid from the government. And who's in the government? Blacks. Then the, little me then the liberal media mocks you for being racist, and these people feel betrayed. The paradox is that Amer immigrants to America have precisely the values of hardworking self-reliance, which is how they succeed in the American economy. In September, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine issued a report by researchers inclined for and against immigration. They found, one, immigration has, quote, little to no negative effects on overall wages and employment of native-born workers, close quote. Two, high-skill immigrant, quote, have a significant positive impact on Americans with skills and on the working class as immigrants spur innovation, helping to create jobs. Three, American teenagers without high school degrees saw their hours of work reduced in competition with new immigrants, but not their ability to find jobs. Four, after the first generation, when immigrants cost the government more than they pay in taxes, about $57 billion annually, mostly for education of the children. In the second generation, immigrants add about $30 billion a year to the tax pool. In the third generation, immigrants add about $223 billion a year to the tax pool. In sum, the report found immigrants to be, and I quote, integral to the nation's economic growth, close quote. In sum, America's economic difficulties stem not from immigration, as the nativist version of throw the bastards out says, but from technological change, improved productivity, corporate tax shelters, and competition from developing countries in the world market. Yet even this is complex because Technological change accounts for far more job loss in the United States than even global con competition. Let's look at the steel industry, which lost 400,000 jobs between 1962 and 2005. But steel production has not declined in the United States. Job loss resulted from increased productivity of the mini mill, where you can produce the same amount of steel um, with far fewer human workers and greater reliance on machines. Overall, only 13% of manufacturing job losses result from globalization, the rest from technology change. While the US lost one million jobs to China between 2000 and 2007, the job loss stopped. There's no economic evidence that NAFTA yielded job loss. Um, as the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service concluded. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a largely conservative business group, reports that the reestablishment of trade tariffs, as Trump campaigned on, quote, in the best case scenario, would strip us of at least 3.5 million jobs, close quote. 
The prestigious Peterson Institute estimates that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so vilified by Trump during the campaign, would raise American wages and raise incomes by about $131 billion. It also found that existing trade agreements have added between 7,100 and 12,900 additional income to the average American household. Yet in Washington, uh, excuse me, in America, breaking up large international agreements designed by who? Washington. Feels like throwing the bastards in government out. Job loss might be addressed in the United States by improved education, worker retraining, and regional redevelopment by local and national government in coordination with businesses, especially businesses that close factories. Doing this, Pittsburgh, for example, compensated for its loss of 5,100 iron and steel jobs over 25 years by redevelopment in new industries, leading to a gain of 66,000 new jobs in healthcare, banking, and, and professional services. Pittsburgh is now booming. Interestingly, democratic states tend to have substantially more of this sort of investment and more progressive taxation than republican states do. And democratic states tend to score higher on income, life expectancy, and education levels. If you don't like these proposals, others might be better. But economic solutions that address America's economic problems often go unseen in the United States because the solutions people favor are a matter of belief. Trump gained the most over George W. Bush in areas that lost manufacturing jobs to foreign competition and where people blamed global trade even though retraining and redevelopment addressed job loss in Democratic voting states. But retraining and redevelopment would mean increased government action to coordinate cooperation among federal government, local governments, industries, and education. And that kind of increased government action is at odds with the civil creed of many who would have to demand such redevelopment programs. Compare the situation today to the Tea Parties, which organized very quickly after Obama's election on a small government, throw the bastards out, platform, because they were tapping into what Americans already believe. The problem is always the government. In Trump's populist base today, there is little, little popular will for the programs I've just described. And consequently, there is little political will. Hostiles calls this the great paradox. Distrust of the federal government by those who need its help. In late 2016, November, December, 6.4 million people signed up for health insurance through Obamacare, far more than in the same period in 2015. The states with the most new enrollees were Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, all of which voted for Trump. In April 2009, in the depths of the economic crisis caused by private investment hijinks on Wall Street, 55% of Americans nonetheless thought the problem was big government, not big business. So when politicians like Trump say that the problem is big government, it sounds right. It taps into America's oldest belief system. It clicks. This goes some way towards explaining Trump's bad boy behavior. His politically incorrect speech adds to his appeal because it's a slap in the face of the educated elites whom Trump voters feel run the economy against them and who condescend to them. His bad boy behavior are a steam valve for anger at government anti-discrimination law that lets those perceived line jumpers, remember in Hochschild's um, imagining of the 
in her research, actually, um, on what Trump voters were thinking, those people jumping ahead a line of you, even though you work hard and do all the right things, those line cutters. It's a slap in the face of the anti-discrimination laws that protect them. In April 2016, the Public Religion Research Institute reported, quote, two-thirds of Trump supporters think the nation needs a leader who breaks the rules. Throw the bastards out and their prissy anti-discrimination laws, too. One definition of tragedy is voting for policies that worsen your problems. The wealthy who voted for Trump made a self-interested but coherent choice for someone who will lower their taxes and promote business-friendly policies. But Trump's populist base may have made a tragic choice. His appointments and policies to date suggests he will not likely address their concerns. The Conservative Tax Foundation estimates that his um, economic plans will raise the debt from 2.6 trillion to 3.9 trillion in 10 years, even with the growth that he promises will come from his economic policies. Moody's estimates a loss of 3.5 million jobs from um, Trump's trade and tax policies.